Hey guys, this is Lala Legacy and welcome back to another episode of 1000 Lies. So before we jump in, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button because that would mean the whole world to me. And afterwards, if you like this video, hit that like button too. All right, let's get into this. I'll do it. Oh, what are you saying? You said that it's a relay race, right? If the team's good, I may be able to help out somehow. But you'll have to make an effort and interact with other human beings, you know. Humans? It's not like I'm going to marry them. I just have to carry a baton. How or how well I run depends entirely on myself, though. Okay, now tell me the truth. Which bet did you lose? How much money was involved? None. Who do you think I am? Ziva and the other two girls look at me with, dis uh, with distrusting eyes. Well, I must admit that this is unusual for me, but I'm ready to go. Isn't the prize discovering what I want to show the world? The challenge that will decide my fate and all of that? Ziva sighs with a smile on her face. Alright, I'll sign you up in Aussie's place. Thank you very much, Indian. The boss returns to her post, takes out her cell phone, and resumes her endless array of tasks. Maybe she came over uh, to us for that short amount of time to get away from her work and recover her energy. Or maybe she considered checking up on us as a, er, on us a duty that was assigned to her. In any case, Ziva always seemed to be well informed and the reluctant attitude that she'd showed me during the past months seems to be gone now. When I turn around, I find Lucy and Claire making obviously uncertain faces. Uh, Sierra, it's not that I want to meddle in your business, but are you going to be all right? You know? Lucy's eyes drift towards my right leg for a second, while Claire remains silent with a solemn look on her face. I remind them that I prefer that they not treat me differently or concern themselves because of it. I try to make light of the situation. Okay, okay. Whatever. It's not like I care anyway. You know that my curiosity is more important to me than your opinion, you schmuck. I find your sudden disposition pretty weird. If I knew this was, or that this was going to happen, I would have also signed up to make you bite the dust. It's a pity that I won't be able to participate. Lucy folds her arms, complains, and leaves. Over time, I've gotten used to her unusual behavior. Even if she doesn't recognize it herself, I know that it's her way of showing concern. She could at least trust, or she could at least treat everyone, not just me like that. Time hasn't helped to reduce the aggression that woman has for me, unfortunately. Lastly, Claire remains in front of me, lost in thought. Noticing that the race is about to start at any second, I try to bid her farewell casually, but she stops me. Sierra! I watch her for a few seconds, unable to figure out what she wants to say. Break a leg! A breeze blows past the two of us. Did I hear that correctly? She says something so insane that I can't help but laugh. Isn't that what they say in show business? Why are you laughing? Watching me laugh is contagious, which causes her to laugh as well. We get to a point that our eyes start to water up. Jesus Christ, Claire, you're crazy. Way too crazy. But I guess it's not bad to see the humor in it from time to time, no matter what happens. Claire buries her face under her hat, still giggling. I think I can see her jaw move a little as if she's trying or as if she's saying something, but I'm unable to hear any sound, so I decide not to overthink it. Goodbye or goodbye, Claire. She brings her hand up to her chest and waves at me. I do the same t for her. I know I'm leaving some things unresolved, but somehow I feel like it's unnecessary to tell her in the first place. How odd is that, I wonder? This may only be a race, however. Well, it doesn't matter. The race starts. I watch the guys whose names I can only barely remember run with all of their might. Meanwhile, I'm taking it easy since I'm the third to go. I don't have the pressure of being last, nor the responsibility of being first. It's kind of an, or it's kind of advantageous. With that in mind, I can focus on running and only running. 
Here, where everything is taking place, there's a totally different atmosphere. During the survival competition, we were isolated, so I couldn't hear the enthusiastic cheers or screams of the audience of the stands. Come on, it's just another contest at an, imp at an improvised sports festival. Why is everyone suddenly this passionate anyways? The second runner takes the baton and flies away like a bat straight out of hell. At this pace, our team can win. Now it's my turn to get ready. No one cared when we, the six committee idiots, wasted our time trying to organize all of this. I'm not actually complaining. Our work went towards making it so that everyone could enjoy this event. It could be interpreted as our way of showing appreciation for all the moments these people have given us despite their intentions. Is that all? Can I make up an excuse like that and be okay with it? Just because something's convenient doesn't mean that it's true. In fact, it's usually the opposite. With so many people surrounding me, both friends and foes, acquaintances and strangers, people I'll never meet again, and authoritarian figures that affect my future, what do I know about what I stand to lose or gain from all of this? That's the real reason I decided to participate. Running is a solitary activity separate from the outside world. It's something I have to do by myself. Several minutes where the entire universe as I know it will cease to exist. I prepare myself, and when I see my teammate approaching me, I start running. I feel the cylindrical object between my fingers and grasp it. The second its previous holder releases it, there's nothing else. It's the track, the baton, and I. I start with a considerable advantage, putting me in the lead. I try to maintain it as long as possible. My performance is surreal considering my body type, but not good enough to handle the threat that begins to encroach upon me. An unknown man catches up to me. His hectic but incessant breathing is all the proof I need to know that he's serious about this. It'll only be a matter of seconds before he overtakes me. That doesn't affect my pace or efforts. At no point do I have any intentions of confronting him. Running is a fight against oneself. It doesn't matter who you're running against or why you're doing it. In the end, your mind is the only obstacle that stands between you and the finish line. If your legs are carrying three times their normal weight as you run, your mind confronts that pressure. It's influence increasing exponentially for every second that you decide not to give up. The reasons each person has to justify their overextension uh, changes between each situation and person. Still, it all requires, or all it requires, is the determination to surpass your limits. What other reason do I have to strain my lungs? What other reason do I have to cover myself in sweat? What about the terrible stench coming from my armpits? The pain jolting through my legs with each step? I look at my surroundings and see observers in the stands cheering for their friends, the inexperienced MCs talking excitedly about the battle we're having on this track. Everything is like an imitation of a tournament or sports festivals. It feels fictional, engineered towards stories of friendship and history. The thrill is passed along from one to another. It creates these types of necessary memories that function as the motivation for the race we all have with, with our lives. We need society to understand us. It's a retroactive relationship where we choose our identity as we search out our purpose in society, even when our very purpose is the lack of one. The sham in human relationships lies within how we forge them sol or solely for our own gain. It's an interest that's uh, defined in our egos and as necessary as the blood within us. Once we choose our role and decide what our aspirations are, we blame the rest of the world when it doesn't grant us our dreams. We become victims of ill-defined terms like culture, nation, or even humanity so that we don't have to accept responsibility for our actions. But there's nothing wrong with that either. It means that we're truly free after all. Free to understand and misunderstand. Free to offend and be offended. Free to deceive and be deceived. Free to run and stand still. Free to be selfish. It's precisely because everyone is looking for their own path that each relationship is genuine in its own way. We usually just tend to look at it from the wrong angle. 
That's why everyone tries to create their own space, their own reflection in a society where their freedom is the norm, ignoring what preceded it and what's around them. We sacrifice that very freedom to create a place that's somewhere between reality and fiction, a festival that imitates those indemonstrable uh, ideals making the impossible possible, a perfect world, a utopia, a fairy tale. But fairy tales don't really exist, nor was this event created for noble reasons. Entirely innocent relationships and ideals beyond belief cannot exist in our world. Only in our lives can we find common ground. We paint our own lives as we wish, and those around us, we paint with bright pink colors. Or red, if you're conscious about, or if you're conscious of everything, if you can see them Oh wait, <laughs> sorry. Or red, if you're conscious of everything, if you can see through all of your actions and become the biggest liar of them all. The pace of my stride slows down. Faster, faster, faster. With every step, I manage to close the distance between us. With each step, I filter out the fatigue and mental weaknesses inside me. We're nose to nose now. My strength is superior and my determination has no limit. I can feel it extending throughout my skin and hands, as somehow I manage to pass the baton on. I pass the object and watch the last member of my team run. He's the star. Everyone's cheering for him, as they should be. A switch goes off in my head and I start cheering too. I know that we can win. No, that we will win. He crosses the finish line. It's our victory. There are people jumping up and down and hugging. The rest of the crowd and our friends come to join us. This is only the beginning. There's, or there are still more hurdles to pass and times to have fun. More trials where we'll relive these feelings. Winning against all odds, enjoying our youth, creating bonds that will last forever and ever. What does it matter if I don't know what the prize is? That has never mattered to me. I've already won by being here. Sorry, that was actually a lie. I hear a metallic sound near my right leg. It stops me from running as I stumble and limp, unsure of what's going on. I look towards my feet. There are small metal links that create a chain, and the contraption is bound around my right ankle by a shackle. Where the chain reaches, I don't know. It's so long that it seems to be lost in the crowd. Apparently, no one else realizes it's there. I try to take another step, but the chain keeps pulling against my foot. I try again at full strength, but it's no use. All that gives in are my bones, creaking as they try to escape from their joints. I fall on the ground and listen to the sound of the other runners passing me, leaving me behind. My vision dulls. I can't tell if I'm going in the right direction. Even after that, I still try to move my body even if it only causes my leg to break. I can't do anything. I can't win. I can't see. The light is gone and darkness descends upon me. My name echoes like a hammer that's tapping against my head. The voices don't stop calling me. Everyone's asking what's going on, how I am, what's going to happen. I can't... <laughs> I can't answer to any of them. I can't even move. If I could answer them... There's one sentence I wouldn't be able to stop repeating. I lost. Whew, that rambling was a bit, uh, intense. <laughs> I blink. My first thought is that I'm at home, in my bed, waking up like any other morning. I hear a whisper through the wall and voices discussing something incomprehensible. Next to me, there's a girl, sitting. No, this isn't my room. This is the nurse's office. Good morning, Sierra. Good afternoon might be more accurate right now, though. In seconds, everything comes rushing back to me. My initial reaction is to bring my hands to my face and rub my eyes. Claire suggests that I should go back to sleep, but I shake my head and sit up. It's best that I get a hold of the situation as soon as possible. What a mess I made, huh? She nods with a calm demeanor that somehow gives me peace of mind. Everyone was really worried about you, so at first everything was a bit chaotic. Still, everything went smoothly thanks to Denise and Aussie. They're holding down the fort. 
The other two ladies, however... Claire points behind her with her thumb in the direction of the door. Straining my ears, I'm able to distinguish the unceasing alarmed whispers coming from behind the wall. You're leaving already? Don't you think we should do something first? You heard what the doctor said, and I can't leave the event un unattended like this for any longer. But that doesn't make any sense. Do you know something I don't? I'm not the one who should answer that. They're behaving well now, but you should have seen how they were earlier. At least they had the sense to leave the room so they wouldn't bother you. I guess I have to go give them an explanation. What you should do is sleep, Sierra. The rest can wait. Claire stands up, trying to make the least noise uh the least noise possible. We will get angry if you go and do something that you'll regret or regret later. Knowing that you're better is all I need to know. Don't be in such a rush and go to sleep. She says goodbye, but doesn't leave until she takes one last long look at me. Even though I can sense that she's in a good mood from seeing me doing so well, I'm unable to bring myself to meet her gaze. I sigh tiredly, thinking about how I should handle the situation from this point forward. Although the door slowly closes as Claire leaves, it impetuously opens again and Lucy flies uh, inside. You're awake! Hi, Lucy. I'm sorry for- Hey! Hey! Her first reaction upon seeing me is to pull the sheets off of my bed all of a sudden. She takes her- or she takes off her shoes and jumps on the other side of the bed, falling on her knees. Then grabs my ankle and lifts my right leg up to my knee. I'm startled and react late. My first reaction is to protect my private parts. She brings her face up to mine with a serious expression on it. What is this? A leg. They're usually connected to the waist. This is probably the worst joke attempt I've made in my entire life. Of course it doesn't work. How did you get this scar, and why did you lose consciousness before? The scar is real. It's just that the smoke doesn't always lead you to the fire, if you know what I mean. Lucy frowns as she tries to figure out the meaning behind my words. She frees my leg and folds her arms, awaiting a better explanation. My leg is healed, Lucy. It's no different than yours or anyone else's. That's what I don't understand. When they examined you, they said there weren't any problems with your leg, that it was just a scar. Then what happened out there? Did you fall unconscious for no reason? Do you expect me to believe that? A somatic symptom disorder. What? It's not that my leg has any issues, it's my mind. Somatic system dis or symptom disorder is a mental condition in which you feel the same pain you would have from a physical wound, but without the physical wound actually existing at all. For example, it's similar to a phantom pregnancy or mass hysteria. Those afflicted by, or by them have symptoms, but they aren't actually experiencing what they believe. Of course, I'm not waiting for an imaginary baby, nor do I think I have cancer just because people won't stop talking about it on TV. I feel the same pain I would if my leg had been crushed and demolished under a huge force or weight. Imagine feeling that pain every day, every hour, every second for the past seven years. Whew, this is gonna hit me hard. Except... Like, having actual pain, not just in the head. <laughs> My mental condition determines how much it hurts at, ev or at any given moment. In that sense, I could do the same physical activities as anyone else, but it hurts as if I'm in hell itself. Lucy's jaw is on the ground as she listens to me, unable to react in any other way. She looks away and I heard her whisper quietly, Seven years ago, that was the library incident. I nod without offering her any further explanation. I can almost hear the clockworks move in Lucy's brain now that she knows about my condition. One after another, she starts asking me tons of questions to confirm her suspicions. 
That explains why you couldn't play basketball in the survival game fine. It depends on what you're thinking, doesn't it? Yeah, more or less. And you don't like talking about it because you're embarrassed that it isn't a real injury, but something that's completely in your mind. My personal experiences have taught me that people don't accept others for who they or for uh, others who are considered crazy, you know. It's easier not to give explanations and endure it. Oh my god, so... The reason why this, like, really hits home for me is because I have had so many people in my life where it's like, after I say, yeah, like, I have lupus, like, here are my symptoms, I can't do much because of my symptoms, and then all of a sudden, like, they turn around, they're like, oh, I have lupus, as, like, trying to say that that's an excuse for them to be lazy, and trying to, like, in turn, obviously, call me lazy, which is not the case. And, oh my god. Oh, I hate people like that. I hate it! Anyways. You run away sometimes because it's hard for you to talk about your condition. Like, at the, or at the arcade and after what happened in the pool on your birthday. Lucy blushes a little as she remembers that day and immediately changes the subject. There's no treatment for it? I mean, well, you must have tried everything by now. There are painkillers, but, you know, you grow to be dependent on them, so it's best not to rely on those too much. Or too much on those. Not too long ago, I switched to a, a more natural alternative, but I guess it wasn't enough for what I have. A cringeworthy laugh accompanies my last sentence, but disappears several seconds later while I scratch my neck embarrassedly. I can't handle Lucy's eyes being so fixated on me from the other side of the bed. This has happened with every or with everyone. It's normal to be polite to someone who's suffered an accident and try not to reopen their old wounds. But how do you act around someone who or someone whose wounds are all inside their mind? What can you say to someone whose pain is buried deep inside of their psyche? Everyone starts treating you differently unconsciously. Their good intentions end up destroying what actually makes humans uh, interesting as individuals. I don't want to live a life where everyone has to worry about every word they, uh, they say as they try not to hurt me. Without freedom, they cease to them or they cease to be themselves. And what can I do about it? All I've ever done was complain about the people who were only trying to help me. That's all? Lucy, however, is like no one else in this entire world. Aren't we all a bit crazy in our own ways? The bed squeaks when Lucy stands on top of it, pridefully putting her hands on her waist. I have my own insecurities. I don't want people labeling me by, uh, by a decision I made without being positive that it was the right choice. But it didn't stop you from offering to show me your secret base. There, I drew until I was finally able to make a decision, and you know what? I'm not sure, or I'm still not sure what I want to do. But doesn't matter. Some will support me and others won't. Some will complain and others will say that I'm reckless. Everyone might be right in their own way, but that's exactly what makes it interesting. Each person decides who they want to be and how to live their life, for better or for worse. It's okay to be an idiot from time to time. Since you told me your issue, I've told you mine. Feeling any better yet? As I've said before, two people can't become true friends until they shared something they're embarrassed about. From my point of view, Lucy looks tall, large, unreachable. Between the sight of her legs and the large presence surrounding her, I'm breathless. It's as if the entire world belongs to her. I give up. All I could do is let myself fall on a pillow. You change your definition of friendship whenever it suits you, don't you? She laughs. Lucy returns to the floor with a jump. She puts her shoes back on and places a finger on her chin as she thinks. Now that I think about it, this illness of yours explains why you're always so grumpy with everyone. No, wait, the schmuck blood just flows within you. Why do you dismiss that possibility so fast? In any case, what do you want to do? Want to go back out there? They're all busy with work right now, so I guess I should go out and give them a hand. 
No, not yet. I would prefer not to overdo it. You just don't want to put in any effort. Tell me something I don't know. Although we share a moment of mutual understanding, it's followed by total silence. We begin speaking at the same time, unsure of what to say. It makes us smile, even though it's cringeworthy. Setting aside our reservations, we finally say goodbye. See you later, alright? At graduation! Yeah, sure. Lucy looks at me from the other side of the room and waves vigorously. It's a totally positive reaction, the opposite of how she was when she got here. Tired, I pick up the sheets that Lucy hadn't even bothered to give back or give me back. After shaking the dirt off, I lay or I lay down on the bed again and sigh. I try to close my eyes, but no matter how tired I am, it's impossible. It's half because of the noise coming from outside, half because I feel like I'm missing something. I move my gaze to the small table beside me. There lies my ever-loyal notebook with a pen sitting on it. I pick it up, rest my back against the headboard, open the book to a new page and start writing. My hand moves naturally, as if it's moving of its own accord. Meanwhile, little by little, I feel more and more drowsy until finally, my eyelids drift closed. What should I do now? Can I really fall asleep at a time like this? I've already fulfilled my obligations and finished my studies and tests. Maybe everything that happened was building up, and that's why I need to sleep right now. Or rather, it's because of everything I've written until now. This story has been going on for too long. You're finally awake! When I open my eyes, the color of the walls has changed, and the noise outside seems to have quieted down. Sitting next to me is an old friend. Before I can say anything, he brings me up to speed on the day. You must be dying of starvation after skipping out on lunch. If you'd like, I can bring you some of the leftovers from the barbecue. You also missed out on the last competition. The other side won in the end, thanks to Lucy's performance in the final battle. Ha! Huh, you'll freak out once you hear this. The truth is, since you've been in here, she lost interest in playing. I don't know why, but all of a sudden she got motivated and managed to turn the tables. It was crazy because in one trial, we'd be doing something normal like a sack race or that kind of thing, but then in the next, we would have to prepare for a bank robbery. The bank was fake, of course. I hope at least. In any case, it was the star, or I was the star of every competition, as you would expect. If I let Lucy win first prize, it's because I'm a gentleman, as you already know. And now, we're taking a break and cleaning up after all of those events. All that's left now is to get our diplomas in the aud or auditorium later on. If you feel better, you can come, but you'll have to eat quickly because they obviously won't let you bring food inside. I'm speaking from personal experience, obviously. Don't ask. This guy never seems to stop talking. Although I'm not completely awake yet and didn't really hear what he was saying, he was uh, narrating everything so passionately that it feels as if I was there myself. When I get up, I notice that my notebook and pen are missing. They should have been on my chest while I fell asleep with them on top of my chest. Instead, they're on the small table that's next to me again. I probably had visitors other than Aussie earlier, so I assume that someone must have moved them aside. That reminds me of something. I interrupt my friend, who's still narrating his adventures from today. I ask him for a favor, something he should do as soon as the graduation ceremony is over. As you wish, Campanero. I'll get in touch with her for you. In any case, um, nah, forget it. Aussie seems worried for a second. Since I'm the one asking him for a favor, I can't complain. So I tell him that he doesn't have to do it if he doesn't want to. No, it's not that. I don't mind, but it's weird that you're asking me for a favor. Don't look at me like that. I don't know how to react when you get serious like this. Even when you're angry, it still seems like you're somehow joking. For example, all day I've been answering questions about what happened in the control booth this morning, but it doesn't seem like you're curious about that at all. Sometimes I can't tell if you don't, or I can't tell if you don't care at all or if it's the opposite and you care too much. 
Don't get me wrong, though. I saw you make the exact same face during the first few days of my transfer to this school, too. When you've lived all around the world, you have certain expectations. In the end, you believe that you'll always have a pl or have to play the role of the foreigner no matter what. You were the only one who didn't care about that. To be honest, I thought you were a delinquent and that you were messing around to try and be the center of attention, but it wasn't like that. I realized something simple, that behind that role there's a real person. Someone who would do whatever he wanted to at any given moment, whenever he felt like it was convenient. He made me view life in a different way, instead of getting depressed and asking who I am or how I should behave. I started to happily wonder each morning who I would be for that day. And who cares if that doesn't fit into anybody's expectations, or if what I felt uh, I was or I was or wanted to be didn't make any sense. It doesn't matter how contradictory it actually is. The roles we played are fun, or were fun, and it truly was fun being friends with you all these years, Campanero. Womanizer, class clown, bookworm, delinquent, narcissist. All we really want is a glimmer of happiness in our lives. Something that gives us meaning and purpose. Or at least, someone who will listen to us and give us a reason to enact whichever role we play that day. Isn't that the kind of person you're looking for? I can't help but sigh as I listen to my friend's words. You know, Aussie, being serious doesn't suit you at all. Who would have thought? <laughs> he leaves shortly after. Some of his words are still going through my mind. Damned Aussie, you make us sound too much like a farewell. I guess he knows more than he seems to. After all, we were friends all this time, right? Oh no. Wait. I hope that they just mean like after graduation that they're gonna like move away or something. Oh gosh. <laughs> The sound of my footsteps and the distant murmur of the occasional birds singing tells me that the day is finally about to come to an end. There are still vest or vestiges of today's events everywhere. Now, under this dusk, coppery light, they're merely fragments of memories that I'll never have the opportunity to experience. That time got dissolved instead in a dream and a short trip I made to, uh, to pick up a thin folder that I now bring in my hands. The key event of the day, the graduation ceremony, has finally come. A long speech before giving us these pieces of paper that we've been fighting for, or fighting for forever. But I didn't go. Once again, I was late. I rest my back against the wall of the hallway, listening to the graduation ceremony from afar since I don't want to interrupt it by entering. It's at this moment that I'm supposed to become an adult. But it's not as sweet to me as to my classmates, since I'm not reliant on a diploma. But on a woman. Aren't you going in? When I woke up, it was already too late. I don't want to bother anyone. I could pick it up another time. Ziva approaches me, not from the auditorium, but from one of the hallways. Her uneasy breathing and the bright red color of her skin make, or makes it clear. She has been looking, or looking for me until now. Now face to face. However, she doesn't know what to say. She nervously clasps her hands together. Shouldn't you be inside? It's why you've been putting so much effort in lately. You know that's not true. Also, as the committee boss, I have to make sure that everything goes well from a distance. It's not my place to be under the spotlight. That includes checking the attendance. It's my responsibility. I should be punished if I'm late. That isn't at all what I meant, Siren. She unintentionally raises her voice. Both of us look towards the auditorium for a minute, worried that someone might have heard us quarreling. Once everything seems to be fine, Ziva takes a calming deep breath and then takes me to a side while pulling my shirt. She guides me to an adjacent hallway in order to stifle our noise. Now hidden in a small gap between stairs, we resume our conversation. A conversation we should have had a long, long time ago. I wanted to say, I... I don't know what to say, Indian. Again with a surname? 
You're not calling me Sierran anymore? That's... Ziva's pupils grow. Even in the darkness, she tries to say something, but holds her tongue, forcing me to begin instead. How long has it been since you called me that? At least seven years. Well, you also slipped up during that dramatic act we put on for the substitute teacher. That doesn't count. The meaning behind those words, you took me by surprise. She looks at her feet, kicking the floor uh, for each word that she says. Everything we've been holding back, everything we couldn't say, we both knew that we'd eventually reach the end of this. Maybe that's why it's so hard. Can you speak, Sierra? And does it hurt more because it's me? It feels like there's a sword piercing through my calf, but I'll bear with it. I have to do this. The special treatment ends here. No more acting like nothing ever happened because you're worried about reopening old wounds. After all, it's my fault to begin with. Ziva gets angry and loses control of her volume again. That's not true! It's my fault! Always silent. I went along with everything. I let others make decisions for me. I acted like nothing really mattered and I didn't realize how much it meant to me until I lost it. Since then, I swore that I would never let anyone make decisions for me again. That I'll never again burden myself with regrets. I promised that I'd heal you, Sierra, and that's why I've put in so much effort. That's why I never stopped studying. And I haven't given up yet, Sierra, and I think I still have a chance. I won't let you destroy everything with that terrible attitude of yours. It's difficult to look at her face. It's even difficult to stand still in front of her. But my words spill out from their weight. After saving them in my heart for so very long, all I need to do now is release them in the same way that I've rehearsed so many times. It's like you said, it's my attitude. There's nothing for you to regret. The problem is entirely in my head. No! Shut up already and stop trying to carry all the blame alone! Mistakes happen. You can't pretend that everything's perfect! Perfect? A dry cackle rises in my throat when I hear the word. You criticized me when I tried to score a perfect game at the or at the arcade, too. The only one of us here that's obsessed with perfection is you, Ziva. What's with this crap? When has the school ever seen a grad event of this magnitude? How can you compare aiming for, per uh, for perfection in a silly video game to your ideal of recreating the Earth in... Or, yeah, recreating the Earth into a fantasy world. You've had everything planned since the beginning. Every step, every word, you naively believe that you can create a perfect world here when you know that no matter what you do, there's always a loser. You're acting like a child that's throwing a tantrum, Ziva. I pant as I speak, my vision clouds, and I'm unable to control my words. All I manage to see clearly are Ziva's lifeless eyes as if something inside of her is slowly breaking apart. Until it finally explodes. I'm done. I'm done, Sierra, and I can't contain it any longer. Who do you think you are speaking to me like that? Or speaking like that when you can barely stand up? Look at you, you're pale. Seven years. Seven fucking years and you're still the exact same. No, you're worse. What's your fucking issue? I'm done with having to beat around the bush with you for everything, treating you like you're a fucking stranger. That's all we are after all we've been through together? Everything with you is a bad joke. You can't take anything seriously. Always using that shitty sarcastic tone of yours. I hate it. I hate it so much and I hate you more. But don't let any uh, or anyone bother that kid. He's sick, so be careful. And you dare to tell me that I'm acting like a kid throwing a tantrum? Fuck you, Sierra, and fuck you for real. Why won't you accept my help or anyone's help? Keep your shitty ass opinions to yourself and try to be goddamn grateful for once, goddammit. It's a difficult situation for everyone, not just you. Don't you get it? Why? I hate you, Sierra. I hate you. Her fists tap against my chest until she's tired. She grabs my shirt and buries her tearful face in it, a pathetic scene that displays what we've been avoiding all of these past years. I move my arm to lean against the wall and Ziva pulls herself along with me, 
The space between us becomes non-existent. I do understand, Ziva. And that's the exact reason I wanted you to forget about me. Her tearful eyes look up at me, not because she's scared of being squished, but because she pities me. She pities me for not having the strength to push us apart. But it's my fault too. I guess I never really said everything that I should have. She shakes her head, not wanting to listen. I want you to be free, Ziva. I'm sorry for not saying this before, for leaving you behind without cutting the ties that I'd created. I'm the one who started this, so I'm the one who has to end it. For that reason. Ziva. I want to break up. I feel her body shaking. Then she stands motionless. In the background, the auditorium's doors open and fill the hallways with cheerful voices of those anticipating the biggest celebration of their lives. The noise it creates makes everything else go silent, our words forever lost between the cheers. A sadness that was hidden, a relationship that worked the opposite of how it should have. Everything we ever said was always the opposite of what we really thought. It's ironic how, once again, the sound of her sobbing is blanketed under the crowd's ruckus, as if it never happened in the first place. I walk away without looking back, climbing the stairs while slowly recovering my lost consciousness. I have to stop a couple of times along the way, inhale deeply, and wait until I'm confident that the pain has eased up. Somehow, I manage to reach the top floor. It's difficult for my sweating hands to grasp the banister. If Aussie did what he was supposed to, she should already be here. In f er, I stand in front of what is now my old classroom. It's still stripped down because of the mess we made this morning during the survival competition. From here, I can see her already. A lone girl peering out through the window in an empty and deserted classroom. I knock once on the door and enter the room while she turns around to welcome me. We're alone, she and I. I thought you'd never come, Sierra. She puts one of her hands on her waist as she tilts her head and smiles. I'm late because I had something to take care of. She's happy. She looks at me without believing or ta or without believing or taking anything I say seriously. But that makes her happier. You ask a girl to meet you in an empty classroom on graduation day and you get there late. Sure, sure. Lucy's acting sly. She immediately turns her eyes to the window again. Over time, I've come to learn that she does that when she's nervous. Right now, she isn't calm, although she's happy in a way. I'm impressed at how easily I've come to understand her personality after such a short amount of time. Even so, maybe it's because of her intensity that I've paid special attention to her. Another reason to finish what I came here to do. Lucy, I... Wait a second, Sierra. She interrupts me before I can finish my sentence. She hesitates, swallowing and pressing her lips with her finger. I have to tell you something first, about something I discovered. I know why you write. I frown in suspicion. For a moment, I don't know what she means. You told me that you have your own reason to write, to carry that notebook with you. I know the reason. I don't know how to react. My mind is blank, yet too overloaded to figure out how to react. All I managed to do is give her a look, asking her to continue. I understood it when I read it. The story from that contest, the one you never wanted to talk about. The story of the, of the three friends entering a haunted mansion, and one of them runs off until he's alone. It isn't a story that you made up, it's actually your own story, one of your past, your life. The chain curse, and how you ended up being separated from your friends, being unable to meet them again. Those are just metaphors, obviously. The mansion incident actually took place in the library. What happened there tore you away from this world. It changed you forever, left you alone. It's a sad ending, but you, or you can't accept it. And that's why you don't like remembering that story. Because you don't want to reopen old wounds. 
And now, with reaching the sun, it's the same, isn't it? The wolf is looking for happiness, the way he proves himself. Your notebook is no more than a diary, one where you write about your life in an exceptionally odd way. It's not that you're bad at writing endings, it's that the world decides them for you. Each end is a new beginning for your next story. The room cools down. A soft breeze flows in from the window as I lower my head. I breathe. Shortly after, I reply. As I was saying, Lucy, I came here to give you something. Lucy is petrified. What are you saying, Sierra? It's the last chapter of my fairy tale. With this, our deal is finished. We no longer have any reason to meet up at the library. But that is all the time that I have for this episode, guys. Oh my god, this was like intense. I cannot wait to get into this again for the next episode. But, alright, so uh, <laughs> if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to like the video. I love you guys so much and I will see you next time. Bye!